Hello, my name is Philip Bloom, and for the past five days I've been road testing this, the brand new PMW EX3. Now there are a number of key differences between this and the 8K cinema camera. It's like a prototype. Tom Tom Sink it's not that it was a better camera than the F55. Resolution as previous models, but far more advanced. And one of the bit is still 8 bits. This is not a low light camera. I've been reviewing cameras since 2008. And this one here, Sony FX6, has confused me more than any other. Let me tell you why. My goal in this video is to make sure that you don't have that same confusion as I do. I'm going to get across everything nice and clearly and succinctly. That will be a first for me. You will be hearing fireworks going off whilst I'm sat here talking to you. It was Guy Fawkes Night a few nights ago. And don't stop letting off fireworks. You know what Guy Fawkes Night is? Google it. Anyway, a quick ethics statement. So this camera was loaned to me by Sony Europe and I'm not being paid for this review. I'm giving the camera back in a couple of days. Yes, I am a Sony Pro ambassador which is a non-paid role. Uh, I'm not bound by any contract. I can use any camera I want. I can talk about any camera I want. I am not asked to just say nice things about Sony cameras, not in the slightest. It's completely a, I don't know what it is really. I mean, they get to use my work on their websites. It's non-paid. Um, and also if I do any uh, seminars or workshops, if we ever are able to travel again, then it can be used in the marketing purposes. And the main thing is I get to use cameras early like this. So there you go. So if you think I am biased, that's completely up to you. You can watch this review. And if you think I'm biased into this, then you'll notice that when I'm talking on camera, I'll be bouncing between two different locations, the Riverside and Richmond, and the South Bank in central London. It's not done to confuse you, it's just done to break things up. This camera is part of the cinema line from Sony, with the Sony Venice being at the top, the FX9 below it, and at the bottom, the baby FX6, which should be a lesser camera than the others, but it isn't. It's confusing. When this camera was announced, I thought it would be the equivalent of the FS5 to the FS7, FS7 mini the FX9. It will be a smaller version of it without all of the bells and whistles and maybe a couple of features that camera doesn't have. But no, that's not what it is at all. So obviously it's small. It's also light. The body only is just 900 grams a slight increase over the FS5's 830 grams. Those 70 grams give us a lot. I won't go into detail here, that will come later in the review, but here are some of the highlights. It's a full frame sensor for starters, using a 10.2 megapixel back illuminated CMOS sensor with its fancy Bions XR processing, giving it a lovely fast readout with minimal rolling shutter issues. It has a measured dynamic range of about 13 stops. Thank you, Gerald Rundon. No. It records in 4K 10-bit XAVCI, just like the FX9. 
but with the ability to shoot at UHD, otherwise known as Quad HD, at 100 frames per second and 120 frames per second. And that's in the S and Q mode with a slight 1.1 times crop. There's also DCI 4K with a few caveats, which I'll explain later. Oh, in 1080p, it can go up to 240 frames per second. It records on dual media. It can take SD cards and the new Compact Flash Express Type A cards. Two slots, and you can use both medias in both slots, just not at the same time. And you can do simultaneous recording for a nice redundant backup. It outputs 16-bit RAW from its SDI out, has time code in, it has the lovely S Cinetone profile, just like the FX9, and it also has S-Log3 and HDR. The amazing internal electronic variable ND is of course in this camera because it's a video camera. Oh, and last but not least, it has that rather special hybrid autofocus system from the FX9. And all that for a launch price of about £5,500. This camera is absolutely superb. It really is an absolute beast. The features are crazy. It pretty much ticks every single box, unless your boxes are 6K, 8K, and maybe internal RAW. Other than that, it's just astonishing. There is nothing that comes close, apart from one camera, and that's where the rest of my confusion comes in. That camera is the a7S III. The FX6 is clearly an a7S III in a pro body, with some better things and some worse things. If you look at the front of the camera, you see the alpha symbol. That's because this camera was made by the alpha division of Sony, although it did obviously work with the pro division. You can see that from the design of the body and also the software itself is very, very, very much the Pro Division. The way that the FX6 works is very much like the FX9, and that's good if you are an FX9 user and you're coming from that camera because everything will be very, very familiar to you. But if you're coming from an A7S III, you're gonna find things incredibly confusing and incredibly counterintuitive. Sorry to interrupt. I need to just pause this because of the autofocus, what's going on there. This is not an issue with the camera. This is me. This is operator error. It was all set up correctly in the initial stuff, but then I saw a shot that I wanted to get. I changed the speed from one to four, and then when I went back on camera, I forgot to change it back. Hence, you get that pulsing. Autofocus settings are so important. I've got a dedicated video all about it. It's called my video autofocus obsession. Check it out. Because it is clunky in its operation compared to the Sony a7S III, which has a, a new menu system, has a really nice implementation of the touch screen, has well, especially the touch focus tracking and that aspect of it is just wonderful. The operation of this camera is, is much, much, much slower. And one of my biggest issues is the way that the autofocus has been integrated into it. It is not the easiest system to use. And the thing is, it's actually not that much different from the FX9. And I got to grips with that okay. But when I got the FX9 and did the review, the A7S III didn't exist. Well, it did exist, I just didn't have it. And that has made me kind of spoilt for a really nice, quick user interface. When you're filming, the last thing you want is to think about how to do something with the camera. You should just be able to do it. So you want to focus on what you're actually filming, of course. And there's a lot of that with this camera. And part of it is because I'm new to it, but I'm not that new to it because I have an FX9. I think it's just if you want to do certain things, comparing it to the way that the A7S III does it, it is, it takes a couple more steps, which slow you down.
I think the reason why I was slower with the FX6 than I am with the FX9 is simply down to the smaller body. They've had to squeeze things onto a tinier frame. There are less custom buttons and they have moved things around. The quick access menu that was first introduced on the version 2 firmware for the FX9 is on this camera and it can be useful for selecting certain things, it's just not everything is available to change. If it's got a box around it, you can change it. If it hasn't got a box around it, you can't. You don't have to use a touchscreen to select things, you can use the little joystick. I wish you could customise it to put the things on that you really need to access quickly. You know, like the function button of the A7S III. The way that the autofocus system works in the FX6 is probably the, the most cumbersome part of the operation of the camera, comparing it to the Sony A7S III. There's just too many steps to do certain things, and it's too imprecise uh, other things. The one thing it's really, really lacking that it desperately needs is touch tracking. You can, well, with the touch screen, which was enabled on the version 2 firmware, the FX9, not that long ago, and it's very similar to this. There is no touch tracking, there's no touch focus, but you can move a cursor around when you have the uh, selectable spot mode. And that's pretty much how the touch focus works, really, that's it. It has great face recognition with the face priority and the face only mode. I'm in the face only mode right now. And that's great. They're, those face modes aren't in the A7S III. But the lack of touch tracking is a big, big thing. Unlike my mobile phone, the autofocus face and eye tracking works with a mask. Kind of useful right now. In fact, it's so good. Sometimes it sees things our eyes can't see. I think that's an Ent. When I reviewed the FX9, it was something that I really wanted to be in there because the Canon cameras had it and some of the Sony Steels cameras had it. And it just makes using autofocus so much easier to just select a subject on the screen, tap it, and it tracks it, whether it's a person or an object or whatever it is. That is the easiest way to use autofocus. My two launch videos for the A7S III, which was Now I See Part 2, and the paddle border, were 99% shot with touch focus, touch tracking, or just touch focus. That easy. It was, you know, somebody who does wear glasses, it can be a struggle at times to make sure that things are in focus, and the autofocus really, really helps you enormously. A flexible spot. This is where I keep going to use the actual screen, but it's some parts of it touch screen, not much, but and then you just you know, so it should all be touch screen, really. All right, so select. This is the clunkiness of it. So let's see what we can do here. So we can be on the bin which is a really cracking shot of a bin. And now we're gonna see these people coming into frame. So what I'm gonna do is touch track manually. So it's basically manual autofocus. You ready for this? And go, 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 go. I'm gonna try and follow them. And I want those people. Okay, that's good. That's good. And I want to go onto the lady here. Bang. So you can drag it, and you can touch it. It's cumbersome though, isn't it? You, you don't want that. You want it to just stick on something. It's just the workaround that I've been using, the only workaround. Actually, it's not the only workaround. The other workaround, I've actually been using this a fair bit, is manual focus. So yeah, definitely needs some work on the way that it does the autofocus. And it feels strange to be doing this and saying this because just a year ago I was filming the FX9 review and it was so exciting to have autofocus in a video camera. It was great. The problem is things have moved on. 
with things moving pretty quickly. And it really is the A7S3's autofocus, which just completely spoils you. So, yeah, that's my problem, really. So let's just follow that guy there. See, this should just track him. The, we know that the camera's capable of tracking because it does it with faces, but it's just not doing it with objects. This is a clunky way of doing autofocus, for sure. It works. And it's gonna be better than using stills lens and trying to rack focus because that is hard. But, oh, this is my problem. So I'm trying to multitask. I'm trying to pan the camera and move my finger to keep on here. It'll be great to be able to make this spot here bigger and smaller, which you can do with the stills cameras, but we can't. The thing about autofocus is it's supposed to make things easier and it does, when it's dealing with faces, without question, it's amazing with this system. It's everything else that is much, much more difficult. That was all shot in manual focus, because it made sense for that. I could have shot in autofocus because it does work in all frame rates, with caveats. You need to make sure that you are on a frequency that works with that frame rate for the autofocus to engage, otherwise it will switch off. For example, I shoot everything at a base rate of 25p, still sometimes known as PAL. So my multiples of that work fine for autofocus. So 50p, 100 frames per second, 200 frames per second, autofocus works great no matter what mode you're in. But if you try and select a frame rate which is not one of those, say 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, autofocus will disengage and it'll switch to manual focus. It doesn't mean that it doesn't do autofocus in that frame rate, it just doesn't do it at that time base. Following me? So you'd need to switch to either 23.98 or 30p or 60p, one of the NTSC time bases. So you're in 23.98 and you want to shoot slow motion. There is 48p in S and Q mode, but autofocus doesn't work. You have to go to 60 frames per second for it to work. I know, don't ask me. Unlike the A7S3, if you want to shoot in anything over 60p in 4K, you have to shoot in S and Q mode because it uses the older XAVCI codec that only goes up to 4K 60p. So everything has to be shot as S and Q mode. So there'll be no audio recorded. There is a dead on 24p mode, as in proper cinema 24p mode. But sadly, at the time of testing, Autofocus does not work in any of the frame rates when you're in 24p dead on, not even 24p. A lot of people criticize my reviews for lacking a certain thing, a certain one thing, 
So I've decided to fix that in 200 frames per second. The FX6 is an absolute low light beast. It is the best low light camera I've ever used. And yes, it's better than the A7S III. And a major part of that is the control you have over noise reduction. I talked about this in the A7S III review and how I got past it with the ProRes RAW. Although it was incredibly noisy when you went to those high ISOs. We have the ability to turn off noise reduction have it on low, medium or high in this camera. And I tend to leave it on low or medium. And it does a really nice job of just taking off that little edge. This section of the video is sponsored by Escape Technology and HP. You can see the HP laptop here. This is the Studio G7 Create. And I have here the Atom Sumo, which is recording the output from this, it's sending a, it's a 4K screen, it's sending a 4K 60p out into the Sumo, which is recording it here. The Sumo is not a 4K screen, but it is capable of recording 4K. The FX6 is not officially called a dual base ISO camera, although technically it is. As far as I know, the reason why it isn't is down to the really high bar that Sony engineers put on themselves with their, with their technology. For them to call it a dual ISO camera, both of the ISOs need to have exactly the same dynamic range. And the high ISO is a little bit less. So therefore we have a base ISO and we have a high ISO as opposed to the FX9, which does officially have dual ISO. Make sense? Okay. So the way that the FX6 does it is the same as the FX9. You have to physically switch between the two to get between them, which is good. I like the way that it does this because the problem with the A7S III is there is no actual marking to let you know when you change. The high ISO on the A7S III is 12,800 like the FX6. Now, if you're shooting and you are at 12,800 and you accidentally just go down a little bit to 10,000, you'll have a much noisier image. By going up, a fraction of a stop to 12,800, it cleans up enormously. It's not noise reduction, it's changing circuits. So it's very easy to be shooting on a, a bad ISO, if you want to call it that, a one which isn't as clean as it could be if you just go up a little bit higher. So we're going to take a closer look at the noise on the A7S III and the FX6 and see how they compare and what you can do to them in post to try and make them better. And to clean things up where I can, I'm using neat video within Premiere. The noise reduction in DaVinci Resolve is, is good, but it's, it doesn't compare to neat video. Neat video is so good, the amount of control you have over it is superb. You just gotta be very careful not to push it too far, otherwise you end up with plastic fantastic. Before we do a direct comparison, let's take a look at the noise suppression circuit in the FX6. 
If you have the noise suppression circuit turned off, you have a lot of chroma noise, as you can see here. But when you go to low, that reduces massively. The next step in medium makes a bit of difference. And the same with the high. But even at the highest, it never looks like what the A7S III does. Because we still have detail. When you see them side by side, you can see that the noise suppression circuit is actually dealing with the chroma noise rather than the luminance noise. So this is the A7S III at its maximum 409,600. I'm going to show you some reasonable ISO exposures, but this is just a good demonstration of just what happens with the in-camera noise reduction. You've lost all the detail. It's just mushy, mush, mush. The FX6 is clearly still noisy, but the detail is there. But the thing is, if you are going to push your ISO up all the way to 409,600, what do you expect it to look like? Do you expect it to be great and beautiful? Because it isn't. I mean, look, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? This is S-Log3 on both cameras. And it looks better because there's a lot more light there. And getting exposure is not about adding ISO, it's about adding light. So here, there's lots of ambient light, or you use a faster lens. That is the key, and when you are shooting, always try and push your exposure to the right as much as you can. Then the noise won't look anywhere near as bad. But really, 409,600, it's only for extreme situations. The A7S III is still a fantastic low light beast. I just really want them to bring in the ability to adjust our noise reduction. It would help so much. When you're using Neat Video in Premiere, make sure it's the first effect that you use. Don't have anything before it like Lumetri because it will completely slow down your computer's rendering, like massively. It's so much quicker if you have it as the first effect. Neat Video is easily the most intensive plugin I've ever used, and it requires a fair amount of grunt in your computer. I normally would use my desktop setup, but you can still use it with laptops like this HP ZBook Studio G7 Crate. It just requires a little bit more patience. The RTX GeForce graphics card inside this laptop definitely helps. Neat Video takes advantage of these things like CUDA acceleration and when you go into neat video settings it does a test and actually it selects just the GPU even though there's eight cores within this computer. The 4k display really does show all the detail and all the noise which is great for when working in these sort of situations and it also makes the image from the camera look fantastic when it's all done and when you put some lovely music over it like I do with all my reviews, it will sound pretty damn good because of the Bang and Erlison speakers. Oh, and look, it's got an SD card reader. I miss those on my MacBook Pro. I've never used a laptop this thin and light that can use neat video before, so I was actually pretty surprised. Use the code ZBOOKPB to get £100 off when you buy through the link in the description. The big question about how the FX6 impacts the FX9 coming in much lower in price and having a lot of things that the FX9 really needs. Higher frame rates, dual slot recording, raw out of the body only. But what does the FX9 have? Well, it has super 35 mil mode. The FX6 does not, although it does have clear image zoom, which is a very clever digital zoom without losing quality, which can go into about 1.5 times while still maintaining resolution. Because the FX9 has a 6K sensor and then it downsamples out to 4K, it does create a more detailed image. And to prove that, I did a super scientific test using this canvas of Harriet as my test chart. I've turned off detail in the FX6 and the FX9 and I've turned it down to the minimum on the A7S3. 
but even at the minimum, it's still not off. So this test was a colossal waste of time because I could barely tell a difference. In fact, I couldn't really tell a difference. If you look at the FX6 and the FX9 side by side, you'll notice that the FX9 is slightly tighter. And it shouldn't have been because it was the same lens in the same position. The film plane was exactly the same point. It was a little bit higher on the FX9 because of the body, but that's it. The FX9 is definitely slightly tighter. I asked about this and the official line is that Sony maximized the performance of each sensor so there will therefore be a small difference when you look at the camera side by side, hence slight crop. A whole year of using the FX9, I never knew and I never noticed. I will now. So there you go, the FX6 is slightly more full frame than the FX9. As we're here, let me show you the difference between the DCI 4K on the FX9 and the FX6. The FX9 has proper DCI 4K. You have the UHD frame, and then you go into DCI 4K, and you have extra stuff on the left and right. But with the FX6, you go into DCI 4K, and it's tighter. It all comes down to pixels. The FX6 actual width of the sensor is 4,240 pixels. It actually downsamples that to 3840 2160 UHD to get the full sensor. But DCI 4K actually samples one to one. Whilst there's more pixels, because it doesn't use the whole frame, it is slightly tighter. Weird, huh? With the A7S III, there is no DCI 4K, but if you shoot ProRes RAW, it actually records all of that sensor's width. You get a 4.2K recording, so you can, hey, have a little bit more than DCI 4K. As we're talking about RAW, the RAW out of the FX6, I haven't really tested, I had a quick look at it. It is out of the SDI, not the HDMI like the A7S III, but you don't need the extension back like the FX9, which is great. It only works in Cine EI mode, and so therefore only works at the base ISO and the high ISO. You cannot change the ISO for any other value, which of course makes it a bit more limiting. The recording resolutions in ProRes RAW are slightly strange, Okay, deep breath. In UHD, it's 3872 by 2192 as opposed to 3840 by 2160. And in DCI 4K, it's 4128 by 2192 instead of 4096 by 2160. <sighs> so both have a bit of a crop. The UHD one has a much bigger crop. This review is just full of bountiful crops. And also for general handheld shooting, it is, I would say it is definitely better because it can go on your shoulder and you still have access to the buttons. Whereas you try and put the FX6 on your shoulder, you access to nothing at all. So it needs to be out in front. It's a huge problem. You can, of course, get some massive counterweights to make the camera sit there, but then you can just turn it into a big beast. I do have a little potential solution to that. Unlike the A7S III, there is no IBIS, and the IBIS inside the A7S III is very good with the active mode. There is an issue with the variable MD and having IBIS. It's something that we will have at some point, but it's just too difficult to implement. We do have the same system as the FX9, which is the ability to stabilize it in post with Catalyst Browse. It needs to be integrated within NLEs and not be a standalone piece of software it needs to be able to take that gyroscopic data and be used by the stabilization of that software, whether it is Premiere, Resolve, Final Cut, doesn't matter because that will give you much better results because it's using the data that's recording from the gyro of the, of the camera actually moving as opposed to looking at the image to try and figure out how to stabilize it. That's what you need. But would I like IBIS in this camera? Yeah, absolutely. Optical stabilised lenses are your friend in this sort of situation. But unless you are using a way of stabilising that camera, whether it is on the shoulder or using El Cheapo, just holding it out in front of you, the biggest issue you're going to have is trying to keep 
the camera level, keeping that horizon level, it's so easy to go off on the camera that's just sitting in front of you. So yeah, definitely an issue when it comes to handheld. So I've got a very stripped down FX6 balanced on the DJI Ronin, or they call it the RS2 now. And yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's nice to have a really powerful video camera on a handheld, it's a small gimbal like this. I had to take off the top handle and the side grip and I've put the LCD here um, at the front, which seems to be fine. Just trying to find a good center of gravity for it. Um, a heavier lens will definitely help a little bit, but I've got to be very careful with the clearance at the back on this one. But at the moment, it seems to be all fine and dandy. The biggest downside is the XLRs are on the handle. So, yeah, we have no audio input. On the FS5, we used to have one on the handle and one on the body. But apparently people were complaining, uh, not me, saying they wanted them together. So now they are. And now we just have them on that and nothing on here. There's not even a 3.5 millimeter input. There is just this little, 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 tiny microphone just there. That's our audio. So, yeah, I mean, you can use it for scratch audio, which is okay. But it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could put um, a Rode VideoMic NTG on there or something like that. But um, we can't. So there we go. Nice gimbal camera. Not too heavy at all. I could do this all day. I'm not going to though. The Variable ND is probably the greatest thing about this camera compared to the A7S III. Yeah, we can have Variable NDs on the front of our lenses and they work well, but they do change the color. There is color shift as you move them because they are two polarizers. It's just how polarizers work. You don't get that when you're using a Variable ND on sensor on the FX6, FX9, or any of the Sony cameras with Variable NDs. It is just the greatest thing. Way better than fixed ND filter wheels. Every camera should have it. One final thing, there is no EVF on the FX6. There was one on the FS5. They got rid of it because it was a pile of poo. Their EVFs on their video cameras have never been any good. But the ones on their mirrorless cameras are great. But I need an EVF. You could get the loop that's on the FX9, but it is a bit heavy for it, so it's all a bit droopy. So a third-party solution, an external EVF like the Zakusa Gratical, just use those third-party batteries with a DTAP because there is no DC power out. Or Sony could actually make this. Take one MI shoe extension, add in an EVF for the MI shoe, this is from the RX1, has a fantastic tilting action. Keep that, please. But improve it, make it like the A7S III one, which is incredible. If you are going to add the whole mount, please don't make it proprietary. Let people make up their own one, if need be. This is a great solution, and I've already got a name for it. You should call it the Now I See EVF. My confusion at the beginning was, is the A7S III better than this? I mean, it has really great IBIS and an absolutely incredible EVF and much easier operation. But then the FX6 is a proper professional video camera that'll be much better to turn up on jobs with with certain clients. And beside that has all those professional connections and the incredible variable ND. And then there's the question, is it better than the FX9? Well, yes and no. It has more frame rates, it is nice and light, and that is important dual recording. But if you want true Super 35mm 4K, proper DCI 4K, you need the broadcast legacy features like interlaced MPEG recording, and soon the ability to use B4 lenses with the center crop. So basically, the A7S III is better than the FX6 in a number of ways, but the FX6 is better than the A7S III in a number of ways. And the FX6 is better than the FX9 in a number of ways. And then the FX9 is better than the FX6 in a number of ways. <sighs>
This camera is one firmware update away from true greatness. All right, a fairly sizable firmware update. Complete reprogramming, ideally, but I would be happy with just some of the key improvements that I've mentioned because then it would be, well, for me anyway, the perfect camera. That is until a client says to me, Philip, we need you to shoot 8K. My goal of this video was to try and make sure that you didn't get confused. I was going to sort it all out and make things crystal clear. And I don't think I've done that because I feel more confused than ever. I know. I think I'm just going to go and do some filming. Sorry. Viewfinder, lens, shoulder mount, all of this, it is a beautiful, beautiful camera and I think really quite revolutionary. And as soon as I can get one and sell my EX1, I will.